Howdy, I'm Kurt Williams, and these are my top 10 comics coming out right now. This Sunday, October 6th at noon Eastern Standard Time, I will be having a live stream telethon where the goal is to raise money for every comic shop in Georgia. I'll be going on that trip the following week and I would really appreciate any help paying for gas and whatnot while I'm out there. During the live stream, we're gonna be doing a lot of things that I'm really excited about, including showing you the first comic I ever made, showing you a comic I'm currently working on making, and we're gonna make a comic together during the live stream. So come be a part of Comic Tuber history and if you could help support this dream I have, that would be really great. Okay, without further ado, let's get into some of the runner-ups for my top 10 list. The first runner-up is the Namor series by Jason Aaron and Paul Davidson. I don't normally like Namor all that much, but I do really like Jason Aaron, and I really liked his run on Punisher recently, so I gave this a try, and it was absolutely worth it. This is one of the most solid stories that Marvel has to offer right now. It's not very likely that you're gonna get a good, solid story with superheroes at this point in time, but this one feels like an actual story story with a beginning, middle, and an end, and it has a point to it, and it has character development that actually sticks to the character. It's not just one phase of this character's life, and then it moves on to the next creator, and they're a totally different character. This has some weight, and I really like that. For very similar reasons, I also like Exceptional X-Men. I know there's only been one issue, and I'm not really a fan of X-Men at the moment, because, listen, I collected all of the Krakoan era, and I love Jonathan Hickman, and I love Al Ewing, and Kieran Gillen, and a few of the other writers who had some titles during that era, but it really went on a downward slope, and by the time it ended, I kind of just wished I hadn't collected it in the first place. And I did the quick math, and even after the discount that my local shop gave me for those issues because I was on a subscription, I still spent like $2,000 on the Krakoan era. So I'm really treading lightly with the X-Men comics. I'm only collecting this and the regular Uncanny X-Men series and all the other ones I want nothing to do with. But this one was surprisingly good. I actually really care about what's happening to the characters. It makes sense for who the characters are that these things would be happening. And the new characters that we're being introduced to don't feel like they're being shoved down your throat. There's actually good reason for them to be introduced. Like when Armor was introduced during Joss Whedon's run on Astonishing X-Men, that didn't feel like it was shoved upon us. We were just introduced to this new character who was already there in the background and they slowly gained a spotlight. And that's how it should be, I think. So it isn't the X-Men series I was expecting to like the most because I'm not a huge Emma Frost fan, but this one is probably my favorite X-Men series at the moment. This is the last last Marvel series on the runner-up list. It's Ultimate Spider-Man. Everybody is loving this title. I think it's pretty good. I love Jonathan Hickman, and Marco Cicchetto is pretty good. It does feel like a fresh take on Spider-Man while still staying true to the character of Peter Parker. My couple complaints are that one, Hickman is not that great at just regular day-to-day -day conversation. It feels kind of stiff and, like, not realistic. And the second complaint is that it's just going kind of slowly. Not very much happens in each issue. I just read five at once, and I feel like barely anything happened over over the course of those five issues. So I can't imagine waiting every month to read the next issue and reading it when it comes out and feeling like nothing happened. But it's a great creative team and it's really interesting new direction for the character, so it is pretty good. Next up on the runner-up list is Transformers. I really like this title, I just don't have a lot of connection to the characters, so it doesn't feel as nostalgic and powerful for me. I love Daniel Warren Johnson, his first six or eight issues, I don't remember how many he drew, were amazing, and Jorge Corona is doing a pretty good job keeping up to par with that, but it's not quite got that magic that Johnson has. I'm sure this is on a lot of other people's top 10 list because it is really well done, and if you care about the characters, you had the toys when you were a kid, you probably really like this. But I just don't have that emotional connection, so that's why it's a runner-up. The next runner-up is Cruel Universe from EC Comics. I mostly have this on the list because issue one really impressed me, and I just love that EC Comics is finally back doing what they do best with good creators. Issue two was not quite as impressive, but it still has that same formula of short stories with a twist, and I really like those twists at the end. If the twist isn't very good, then the whole story just kind of sucks, but I'm here for the ride. I love the new expanding EC universe, and I really hope that it takes off and people buy it enough that we can get lots of great creators in on this doing short stories, using voices that maybe they don't have the opportunity to use in more long-form stories. It's creepy, it's fun, it's ironic, it's surprising. It is a lot of fun, and I think you should buy it, but it just barely is not in my top 10. The next runner-up is The Sacrifice by Rick Remender, and it looks like Max Fiumara is not the artist on this issue. Maybe he's taking a break, or maybe he's just done. I loved his artwork on it so far. Now they've got Andre Lima 
Araujo? I don't know how to pronounce that, I'm sorry. I love just about everything Rick Remender does. He's so good at world building, he's so imaginative, his dialogue hits hard, and he loves to discuss ideas with lots of depth and social implications, and I really appreciate the commitment that he seems to have to showcasing what is right and good in a world that so often tries to be wrong and evil. In general, it feels like Rick Remender likes to present you with what looks like shades of gray morality and then make it black and white and make you choose what you believe is right. So there's a really great strong concept hiding underneath this great world building and all these excellent characters. It's very colorful and vivid and a little depressing but very good. And then my last runner-up is another Rick Remender book. That's The Holy Roller by him and Joe Troman and Andy Samberg and it's still being illustrated by Roland Bashi. It looks like it's just about done. There's only nine issues. Issue seven just recently came out. This is a classic vigilante fighting Nazis story. It's brought into the modern day which makes it more accessible. I think it's really funny because you got Andy Samberg in there and Rick Remender is also pretty good at being funny. Like I said, I love Rick Remender. This is a lot of fun. I absolutely recommend it. And that brings us to number 10 on my top 10 comics that are coming out right now. It's Saga by Fiona Staples and Brian K. Vaughn. This series does not stop being good. We're on issue, what is this, 68? Of course, I have the first compendium here and I read it all in one sitting. It's amazing. This is an emotional roller coaster. I very rarely feel this attached to every single character in a story. So, when one of them dies, it is a terrible gut punch, but it's so exhilarating. You just want more. It's so binge-worthy. You really should just read as much of this at once as possible. The world building is amazing. It's so imaginative and colorful and vivid. There is so much going on in here, so much social commentary, but at its heart, it's just a mother caring for her children during wartime, and it is a very compelling narrative. So that's number 10, Saga. Number nine, the only Marvel series that made it to my top 10 list, and just at the last second, too because I had to go back and read like six issues in a row that I'd been skipping. It's The Incredible Hulk by Philip Kennedy Johnson and Nick Klein. Now I kind of took my time warming up to this one but once I got there it is really great. If you liked the Immortal Hulk series this one is just kind of expanding on those ideas and making it a little bit scarier. We have a lot of references to the one below all. We have a lot of references to the green door. We just have more creatures from that era and from that area showing up and causing havoc in the Hulk's life. There are a lot more monsters in this series than there were in the Immortal Hulk series, and Nick Klein is doing an excellent job illustrating them. I mean, the textures and the colors here are just unique and striking, and they have that older sense of nostalgia to them, like they came out of a creature movie from the 30s or 40s. I'll admit I'm not really into supernatural stuff, but when you have pages like this with giant, scary, elder creatures, I don't know, it's pretty cool. I think that Philip Kennedy Johnson is doing a great job of expanding the lore of the Hulk while also keeping it kind of grounded, whereas in Immortal Hulk, Al Ewing made the Hulk turn into the universe or something at some point, and that was going a little bit too far. This is creature horror that the Hulk has found himself in the middle of, and it feels like it's staying in its lane in the Marvel Universe while also staying tied to the Marvel Universe. So, out of all the Marvel titles coming out right now, I think this one is the best. In eighth place, I know that some of you might consider this cheating, but I just have all of Ghost Machine taken up the slot for one, because everything Ghost Machine makes is of such high quality that I couldn't just pick one. So right now they're putting out Rook Exodus, Geiger, and Redcoat, and I love all three of these series, and soon they're going to be putting out Hyde Street and the Rocketfellers and a few other titles, and you know that I'm going to be buying those too. All three of these titles are written by Jeff Johns, and he is a veteran of the industry. He's very good at what he does, and it feels like these stories are him telling the stories he wants to be telling. Combine him with artists like Jason Fabok, Gary Frank, and Brian Hitch, and you have comic gold. Rook Exodus is probably my least favorite of the three, but I think it has the coolest setting, and when you have have a giant turtle outfitted like a tank that's just pretty sick. Geiger can admittedly be a little bit slow and a little bit cliche, but this issue in particular made me love the series even more. On this issue, we focused on his two-headed wolf, and it was stupendous. I loved it. And Redcoat is probably my favorite because I just love historical fiction, and this feels like Forrest Gump if he lived forever and was kind of a selfish jerk. It's American history with supernatural elements to it, all lavishly illustrated by the great Brian Hitch. I love 
love this series. I am 100% on the Ghost Machine train, and I think you should be too. It's worth it. And look at this, they've even got Junkyard Joe action figures. You know how tempting that is for me? He looks so cool. In seventh place is yet another Rick Remender series. It's Napalm Lullaby by Remender and Bengal. Though I will admit that I don't have a ton of emotional connection to this series, I do think that it is Remender's most well-spoken series. I think it's the most imaginative out of all the series he's coming out with right now. I imagine that plenty of people see this series as an attack on organized religion, but I would argue that Remender is not that two-dimensional. I think he's searching for what's right and good, and he'll find it wherever it is, and he's just saying that in this situation, this organized religion is a cult, and it's inspiring people not to think for themselves, not to feel for themselves. So pair that commentary with these characters who have these crazy powers, like her power is to dream, and her dreams come to life, which is why she's called Napalm Lullaby, because if you sing her a lullaby, she's gonna be basically a big bomb. Same as every Remender series, the character development is excellent, the pacing is excellent, the commitment to the social commentary while also having a cohesive and engaging narrative is excellent. It feels gritty and fantastic and real all at once, and it is a great package that I think is absolutely worth reading. So that's number seven, Napalm Lullaby. Number six, I love this series. It's kind of goofy, but it's also kind of serious. It's Uncanny Valley by Tony Fleece and Dave Wakter. I have loved this series since the first issue. It's like if you took Who Framed Roger Rabbit or Space Jam and you mixed it with Percy Jackson. This real boy is the descendant of cartoon characters and he's got all these weird cartoonish powers that he doesn't quite understand and he's trying to come to terms with them and there's this evil cartoon that's trying to destroy him or something. Honestly, I missed an issue and I don't understand what's going on right now. But I love this sense of humor. I love the overall plot. It's really drawing upon lots of classic cartoons with the animation style they chose and as a fan of older Looney Tunes, it is really satisfying for me. I would argue that this is better than Tony Fleece's current series, Feral, and better than Local Man, which I know is either nominated or just won Eisner Awards. So this is good. I absolutely recommend you read Uncanny Valley. In fifth place, I know that I've talked about this one a lot. It's The Deviant by James Tinney IV and Joshua Hickson. This series is so well put together. Not only is the dialogue solid and the art itself is solid, but also the design is solid. The fonts are solid. Everything about it feels like you're watching a TV show. I very rarely read comics that can establish a mood this solid and then stick to it and keep you engaged throughout the whole issue and the whole series. Tinian has a habit of inserting himself into pretty much every story he writes. The main character is almost always transparently him. But that doesn't make it cliche or shallow. It actually brings a lot more depth to it. It's very personal feeling, like he's lived these experiences so he is uniquely equipped to talk about them in a way that is very emotionally impactful. I've got a few other videos about this series if this sounds interesting to you at all, I recommend just going and watching one of those videos or picking up the series for yourself because it is not a waste of money, I can promise you that. Number four on the list, this is the most recent series on the top 10. It is Frankenstein by Michael Walsh and Tony Marie Griffin. I was so impressed by this series just by the first issue that I had to put it on the top 10. This was written and drawn by Michael Walsh and you can tell that it's the same person because it's one of those comics that just feels so cohesive. The vision is there, it's fully realized. And man, where where has this artist been? His body language and expressions and the panel composition and the layouts of every page are so solid. There's so much emotion and experience conveyed in every single page of this issue, it's incredible. And what I really like about it is that we're seeing the story of Frankenstein from a new perspective, at least a new perspective for me. I haven't read the book yet, so I don't know what's normal in the book, but in this series we're following a child whose father died and then his hands were used in the creation of Frankenstein's monster. So we have this very specific emotional connection to the monster that I've never had before. And Tony Marie Griffin is just killing it on the colors. I mean, look at the atmosphere on this page. Look at the great of those pinks and purples fading into the dark night sky. Oh, that's good! I mean, really, just look at this two-page spread. That is explosive. You feel like you're in it. You can hear it. There's no sound effects. You don't even need them. This series is truly a work of art. I love it. But a series that I love even more, ranked third in my top ten, is Helen of Windhorn by Tom King and Bill Quiss Evely. Oh, this series is so good and exactly what I want to read. This is high fantasy, classic pulp fiction literature told from a bunch of different perspectives all at once. There's Helen's perspective, of course, which is very enjoyable, but there's also the perspective of her nanny, who is relaying all the information of Helen's adventures to this reporter in an interview that gets taped, and then that tape gets shuffled around from one auction to another, from one comic convention to another, until eventually it's sold, and 
a garage sale. So not only do we have this very visceral connection to a Conan the Barbarian type universe, we also get to see it from the perspective of comic nerds and historians. We can see how this information, which was so impactful in the 30s in particular, slowly travels through time and loses value in the eyes of most people, but gains value in the eyes of other people, and how that information, which is so valuable, gets treated by people who just don't understand it. So not only is this a beautifully crafted fantasy story, but it is also a commentary on how the hobby of comic collecting in general functions. Of course, it's exciting and exhilarating at times, but it also has these deeply sad and touching moments. It's heavily literate. It has some of the most extensive vocabulary that I've seen in a comic recently, but it's also very accessible. And honestly, do I really need to say anything about Bilquis Evely's art? I mean, it's amazing. It's delicate and powerful at the same time. I love Helen of Windhorn. It is fantastic. Number two on my list is a series that I dearly love, but also deeply frustrates me for reasons that will be apparent if you come to the live stream on Sunday. It's The Nice House by the Sea by James Tinney and the Fourth and Alvaro Martinez Bueno. This is the follow-up series to The Nice House on the Lake. Nice House on the Lake was amazing. I loved it. This series is equally amazing. It's the end of the world and only a few people were saved and now they got to figure out what to do with themselves. Little do they know that not all of them get to stay there. Now, of course, the overall concept is very engaging and interesting, but what makes this book tick just like every other James Tinney and the Fourth book is the profound emotion emotional content. This is one of Tinian's most introspective books. These characters are examining their friendships in such great depth, and when you consider that one of the characters is an alien that knew the world would end and chose his friends to survive, it just makes everything more complicated and squishy. I think that when we say a writer is good, it means that they have successfully tapped into a feeling we had in our hearts that we couldn't quite get out, we couldn't quite describe, but they put it down in a way that's so eloquent and obvious that it it just feels right and truthful. And Tinian is very good at that. He can say things about the human experience that you would have never been able to put into words, but just feel so right and obvious. Not in like a cliche way, but in more like, uh, you know how sometimes when you have to burp, but you just can't, you feel like you just have to get something out, but it won't come. This feels like you finally got a truth out. It's finally out there. You can look at it, observe it, and say, yes, that's what it is. It's been that all along. Anyway, maybe that doesn't make sense, but what I'm trying to say is this is really well written. The story is great. The concept is great. The characters are great. The art is amazing as usual. Number two out of ten, really great series. And then I'm sure this will come as a surprise to nobody. My number one current comic coming out remains Kaya by Wes Craig. I mean, really, just look at that cover. Isn't that just the most striking cover on the stands right now? Wes Craig is crafting a beautiful story about finding your purpose in the world. We're following this girl Kaya as she tries to deliver her brother, who is considered the chosen one, to safety. And that is how simple the plot is. But just like a game of D&D, there's a billion side quests you gotta complete, and that's what it's been for 20 issues. Wes Craig writes and draws it, so of course it's very cohesive. Wes Craig is a super gifted artist. His skills are beyond my capacity to describe. It is just amazing work. You may have seen him popping up recently on some covers, doing some variants, especially for the all-in movement in DC, and I saw a couple connecting covers he did for Marvel recently. If you saw those and were not that impressed, please know that this series is him at his absolute best. Just like Jeff Smith's work on Bone looked perfect in that universe and then looked kind of weird when he did maybe Shazam and whatnot, you might think that Wes Craig's art style looks weird on Superman or Spider-Man, but in this series, this is what it's made for. And of course, we can't overlook Jason Wordy who does the colors because the colors in this series are just immaculate. Ooh, I love watercolors so much. The series is so colorful and striking, but it's never overwhelming. It's never so colorful that you can't focus on the story. It's just really good at setting an atmosphere and then sticking to it and making sure that you're engaged. I have said countless times in my videos how much I love this series. I have another video called This is the Best New Comic, which is all about this series where you can see tons of pictures of how great the art is. This has been my number one favorite comic since it started coming out, and it will probably remain that way. Once again, that is Kaya by Wes Craig. So that's my top 10 modern comics list. If you have other comics that are on your top 10 list that you didn't see here, 
drop them below. I'd love to see them. A couple quick updates. Right now, I'm trying to worm my way back into the teaching profession instead of what I have been doing. So my schedule is looking a little bit weird. My videos might be slowing down a little bit. But like I said, I'm going to be hitting every comic shop in Georgia in two weeks. And even if I start teaching full time, I'm still going to have all summer to go to other states and visit their comic shops. So don't think that the channel is just going to up and die because I get busy because we're still going to make these videos. And if you would do me the honor of showing up for the telethon this Sunday, and if you could donate anything to the cause, even $5, you know, buy a gallon of gas, it'll go a long way and I'd really appreciate it. So I'm Kurt Williams, that's my top 10 comic list. If you read them, what do you think? And if you've got other top 10 issues, what are they?